It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Before I uh, bring my comments or my first question to the Premier, I think it's important that we acknowledge uh, the loss of a person who was educated in Windsor and played a big role in the business community in the auto sector. Uh, Mr. Marcio Marchioni uh, was uh, you know, a, a trailblazer at Fiat Chrysler, uh, and uh, his loss will, um, I think, impact many, many workers and many, many other business people around the world. So My, my first question is to the Premier. Uh, yesterday, I asked the Premier if consent would be included in the curriculum this fall, but the Premier refused to say yes. He refused to say that consent would be taught in Ontario's classrooms. And in the year 2018, that is a decision that fails every student in Ontario. Why does this Premier think that keeping his social conservative friends happy is more important than keeping young people and young women safe. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Leader of the Opposition, I'm going to tell you who we're going to keep happy. We're going to keep the parents happy. We're going to keep the parents happy. We're going to keep the parents happy because they weren't consulted. Only 1,600 people were consulted around the province. Again, that's 0.001% of the population that has not been consulted, that were consulted, that have not been consulted. We're looking at, my friend, I know, a little tongue twister there, I agree. At the end of the day, my friend, 1,600 people out of 14 million people were consulted. What we believe in reaching out to the parents I know the Leader of the Opposition doesn't believe in consulting with the parents. They believe in the government making the decisions. Well, I'll tell you, we're going to do the largest consultation the province has ever seen. We're going to crisscross this province to 124 ridings and consult with the people. That matters, and that's the parents. Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Members will take their seats. Members will take their seats. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, might I submit that this Premier has no idea what I believe, nor is he an expert on what we believe as New Democrats. <laughs> yesterday, Speaker, yesterday I asked the Premier if gender identity, sexual orientation and LGBTQ families would be fully included in the curriculum this fall, but the Premier failed to say yes. In fact, he said, that's not up to us to decide. And in the year 2018, Speaker, that too is a decision that fails queer young people in Ontario across our province. Why does this Premier think that keeping his social conservative friends happy is more important than keeping queer youth safe? Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, Leader of the Opposition, this is about the curriculum. This is from a gentleman named Mr. Jagmeet Singh. Do you, do you know him? Yep. Yep, I remember him? Mr. Speaker, I stand today once again to voice my concerns my, my constituents around the health curriculum in our schools. When it comes to proper consultation, it is clear the Liberal government has not learned from previous mistakes. The lack of, the lack of inclusive consultation before announcing the curriculum was disrespectful to parents in my constituency and the mistake of the Liberal government. I remember that. Thank you. Final supplementary. Stop the clock. Order. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And I, I think it's clear to everyone who was paying attention during those days of the uh, decision by the Liberals to announce the curriculum without a proper consultation in terms of communications. In terms of order. The government members will please come to order.
Leader of the Opposition. Asians plan because they were worried about a Sudbury by-election scandal. That was their irresponsibility, and I think everybody would agree. But this premier, in fact, is driven by insiders and backroom deals. Instead of moving Ontario forward, he is denying the realities of 2018 by failing to teach consent, cyberbullying, gender identity, and sexual orientation. And he is doing it because Charles McVitie and and Tanya Granick Allen told him to. Why is this Premier more concerned about keeping Charles and Tanya happy than he is about keeping millions of young people safe? Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad the Leader of the Opposition has acknowledged there wasn't enough consultation. Exactly. I'm glad One of your own even agree. Yep. They even agree that there wasn't proper consultation with the parents. And again, I can assure you, we're going to consult with the parents right across this province. Thank you. Stop the clock. Members will take their seats. Restart the clock. Next question. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. And it's, it's unfortunate that this Conservative government is making decisions based on their political best interests, just like the Liberal government did when it came Shame. to making sure that the curriculum was well communicated. That was the problem that happened, and that's what we're all paying the price for now. Decision after decision with this Premier, however, uh, is being made uh, as a result of influence from insiders. And we see it with sex ed, and we see it with hydro as well. The Premier says that getting rid of uh, the CEO costs, we're going to be zero costs, absolutely zero costs. But we know that Mayo Schmidt will walk away with at least $9 million, and ratepayers could be on the hook for another $103 million if the deal with Avista falls through. When will the Premier release the full details and full costs of his backroom deal at Hydro One? Premier. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Speaker, Leader of the Opposition, you have to get new material. We're going over and over and over every single day about this. We're going we're to make sure that we save the taxpayers of Ontario $790 million, $260 per family. We believe in putting money back into their pockets, lowering the hydro rates, lowering taxes, creating good-paying jobs. Yep. We're going to have this economy booming in Ontario, yep. and we're going to lower the hydro rates. And again, I just want to remind you, through you, Mr. Speaker, Leader of the Opposition, the CEO had zero severance. Yeah. Yeah. You start the clock. Supplementary question. Well, I guess the leader of, uh, or rather, the premier of Ontario has a problem with numbers, Speaker, because a six million dollar man turned into a nine million dollar man uh, with this premier's uh, backroom deal. And deals like this will make it even less affordable for the people of Ontario. In less than a month, he turned the six million dollar man. I apologize. The government side has to come to order. I can't hear the Leader of the Opposition. I apologize. Leader of the Opposition. Man. He could end up costing Hydro One ratepayers over $100 million, and we have no idea what other hidden costs are still buried in the Premier's secret backroom deal. And I will continue to ask those questions until this Premier actually answers them for the people of Ontario. So, if he, believes, if he believes he got such a great deal with Hydro One, why won't he just release it so that we can all judge, Speaker? Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I find it very, very rich. Not just rich, but very rich. She's uh, the, the Leader of the Opposition is talking about numbers. Now I have to admonish the Opposition because I can't hear the Premier. Please come to order. I apologize to the Premier. Leader of the opposition made a small little mistake on our budget to a tune of five billion dollars. Just a glitch. Just a just a little little glitch. My friends, when it comes to when it comes to adding up numbers, again, that's a little rich on your behalf, Leader of the Opposition. Through you, Mr. Speaker, we're gonna make sure 
that we scrap the Green Energy Act. We're going to make sure that we lower hydro rates. We're going to make sure that businesses are competitive. Because, Mr. Speaker, when I travel around this province, I talk to hundreds and hundreds of businesses that were saying if we don't lower the hydro rates, they're moving south of the border. And if it was up to the Leader of the Opposition, she'd have the highest hydro rates yep. in the world, not just in North America, and drive every single company out of Ontario. Here, here. Final supplementary. Speaker, I think the Premier needs to look in the mirror around who's going to be driving business out of Ontario with the policies that he's been putting forward. The job, Speaker. The job of the Premier is to work for all Ontarians, right. but scrapping sex ed only works for radical social conservatives. Scrapping cap and trade will only work for big polluters. And cooking up a secret backroom deal at Hydro One only works for the $9 million man. Or else the Premier would be happy to release the details of that deal, Speaker. So why is the Premier being driven by insiders, lobbyists, and backroom deals when he should be working for all Ontarians? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, cap and trade, since you brought that into the conversation, that is the first step to lowering gas prices here, by here. 10 cents a litre. We need to make sure that businesses are competitive in the climate we're facing today to compete against people around the world. And we'll do that by lowering their taxes, cutting, cutting as much as we can out of the 380,000 regulations businesses face every single day here in this province, lowering hydro rates again by 12 per cent. We will be the envy of the world. We will be the engine of Canada once again. Finally. Members will take their seats. Next question. The uh, member for Temiskaming Cochrane. My question is to the Premier. On Monday, the Business Council of Canada sent a letter urging the government to reconsider the White Pines Wind Project Termination Act. The letter says, and I quote, We believe this legislation, if enacted, will undermine investor confidence and set an unfortunate precedent for how the government intends to deal with the private sector. End of quote. It goes on to say that this government's actions risk jeopardizing Ontario's reputation for fair dealing and respect for the rule of law. WPD has already said they will be seeking $100 million from the province for breaking the White Pines contract. Why is this government bent on burdening Ontario families with, that, with yet another multi-million dollar electricity boondog? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, what this government, what our government is bent on doing is reducing hydro rates by 12 yeah. percent. Over the past three weeks, we've made, taken extraordinary steps to ensure that the renewed leadership of Hydro One will make responsible business decisions moving forward, Mr. Speaker. We're confident that we've made good choices here, put the kind of legislation in place, Mr. Speaker, that will ensure that moving forward, Ontarians will experience a lower hydro rate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. This Conservative government talks about making Ontario open for business, but has at every turn shaken the business, community, tr business community's trust in dealing with the province. In just six weeks, this government has managed to cancel renewable energy contracts that will likely cost Ontarians hundreds of millions of dollars in penalties. And they pushed out the board and CEO of Hydro One, which a banker quote in the Financial Post described the act as an unprecedented intrusion into the cap private capital markets. And in our part of the world, Big employers like Glencore are expressing serious concern about the instability of the practices of this government. Right. Does this government, Conservative government not understand that making Ontario open for business means more than putting right. up a big neon sign on the border? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In my own discussions with people in Kenora Rainy River, uh, throughout the province, my colleagues, uh, Mr. Speaker, have expressed nothing but um, extreme uh, pleasure with the renewed leadership process that we're undergoing with Hydro One. They're confident that they'll make responsible business decisions. The termination of those contracts represents 
the fact that these weren't just projects that Ontario didn't need. They were ones that their communities didn't actually right. want, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. We'll not make apologies for making good choices around uh, lowering hydro rates and respecting taxpayers' dollars. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Stop the clock. Members will take their seats. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga East, Cooksville. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Minister, I see from news reports that you attended the Emergency Federal Immigration Committee hearing on the impact of the crossers. I understand that the bill created through federal inaction and lack of follow-through has now reached $200 million. Minister, can you please tell us how, how this bill keeps adding up and whether you have heard that the federal government will pay this bill? Thank you very much uh, to the member. Um, I want to congratulate him on his election to this House. I'd also think it's important to note he is the first Muslim elected to our party, and we are very happy. Stop the clock. Members will take their seats. Restart the clock. Maybe bias as well, Speaker, but I think that uh, so far in question period, that was the best question. <laughs> and it was the best question because he wants to demonstrate how the members on this side of the House and in this government want to stand up for Ontarians. Yeah. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to uh, attend the federal uh, immigration hearings, the emergency hearings given the uh, high immigration uh, level, the uh, high refugee crossings uh, in the province of Quebec. They're having an impact here in the province of Ontario. The member asked me uh, to outline the cost. We are now at over $200 million, and I can itemize it this way. $90 million is going towards uh, social uh, assistance, $74 million and growing in shelter Response. costs in, in Toronto, $12 million in shelter costs in Ottawa, $3 million that I signed off on today for the Red Cross and $20 million in education. I think we need to make sure we're standing up. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Minister, thank you for that answer. The bill seems to keep going up. I wonder if you would support a recorded vote in this House that calls on the federal government to follow through on its decisions and be a stand-up partner that pays its bills. Thank you. I appreciate the sentiment from the member, and uh, I certainly will be in support of all members of this legislature standing up for Ontario and asking the federal government to commit to funding $200 million worth of bills that have been piling up as a result of a crisis that was created by their own doing. The federal government has sold jurisdiction over border management and Canada's refugee and asylum programs, including who is eligible for a refugee claim. What we're simply saying is we want the federal government to support us. We want their $200 million. And I personally want every member of this legislature to stand up for Ontarians. Here, 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 here. Thank you. Next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. My question is to the Premier. Earlier this week, following an impromptu meeting at City Hall on gun violence, the Premier said that the Conservative government will take funding for mental health and addiction support and put it into policing services. Let me be clear. Ontario's New Democrats have been fighting for first responders to get the mental health and PTSD supports they need, and we support the investment. Mental health is an urgent matter. There are thousands of young people that wait 18 long months for mental health services, and Ontarians deserve to know what this government's mental health plan actually is. Can the Premier explain how the money will be allocated to address Ontario's mental health crisis? Minister well, I thank the member very much for the question. The issue of uh, people waiting for long periods of time to receive mental health services and treatments and addiction services and treatments is a, is a serious problem, well, one that we promised during the election campaign that we were going to address and we will address. We are putting $1.9 billion into developing a will be matched by the federal government. And certainly we want to look at victim services, we want to look at first responders, but we also want to make sure that people get the help that they need. The senseless tragedy that happened on the Jan 4th is sadly an example of the need to have the programs and services available for people. That is what we promised to do, and that's what we will deliver on. Supplementary. 
The Conservative government has remained tight-lipped on exactly how mental health funding will be spent. Siphoning off the money needed to address waitlists for mental health services isn't the answer, and the Premier should not get away with breaking a $1.9 billion promise to fund mental health and addictions. We also learned this morning that the Premier has cut funding from $2.1 billion to $1.9 billion over 10 years. Mental health money that is going towards policing should be in addition to the original $1.9 billion commitment to fund partnerships between police officers and mental health workers, like what's been happening in Waterloo Region. So my question, how will this government ensure that reallocating mental health funding does not exacerbate the mental health crisis here in Ontario? Thank you. Our government is presently working on developing a comprehensive mental health and addiction system, which actually takes into account about 12 different ministries that have an impact. It's Attorney General, it's Housing, it's Comstock, it's Health, and many others. We are not prepared at this time to specifically allocate money, but I can assure you that this is the biggest commitment that has ever been made in terms of mental health in this province. $3.8 billion is a lot of money. We want to make sure that we address all of the We start the clock. Next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are troubled by the shooting on Danford, and we feel sad for all the victims. It's horrible, and this reminds me of a violent incident in Mississauga Centre during my campaign. This attack at the Bombay restaurant a few steps from my office. This incident hurted many people, but they were fortunately no dead. Statistics are there, and violence increases in Ontario and in Toronto. According to the, the police, there were 218 shooting in Ontario, an increase of 71 person compared to last year. My question uh, to the Procureur General, can she talk about the plan to fight all violent crimes in the Great Toronto area? Merci, Monsieur le Président. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I wish to thank the member for the question. The priority is always to make sure that the people are in safe. Uh, our government will work uh, with govern the federal government, the mayor, Chief of Police to make sure to avoid another strategy. During our meetings with the Premier, mental health is uh, very important. That's why our government will invest will invest one billion nine hundred one billion nine hundred million dollars to support uh, the federal government will invest the same. We work with the federal government to make sure that, uh, that the system can be used to foresee the program in Ontario. Thank you. This summer, it was very hard. There were many people on the street to take advantage of this summer. Safety is a priority. Residents of Ontario deserve uh, safe streets. Women and women of the first, uh, first respondents. How will the district attorney work with the first respondents to make sure that our streets are safe as much as possible? Mr. Speaker, the Premier asked my ministry as to security other ministry and correctional services to work with different governments, including police services. In the next few weeks, we'll talk to experts to make sure that all programs and policies funded by the promise to make sure there's safety on the streets. 
and to, to make sure to control violence gangs in Ontario. The ministry wants to find a solution to eliminate gun violence and to have stricter rules at the federal level and to improve uh, measures to fight against contraband and to make sure there are less guns on the streets. For Beaches East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Like every community in the province, Toronto is in the midst of an opioid overdose emergency. Today, there are 18 supervised injection sites and overdose prevention sites in Ontario, half of which are right here in Toronto, and they are saving lives every day. But during the campaign, the Premier inexplicably said he was, quote, dead against them. Yesterday, the health minister admitted that they have merit, and she said the Premier would listen to experts. Will the Premier himself stand up and confirm that he is no longer dead against supervised injection sites and overdose prevention sites, which are saving lives every day? Minister of Health, Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you, Mr. Speaker, to the member. I'm sure you are aware of a subsequent statement that was made by Premier Ford, wherein he said he was going to listen to the evidence on supervised injection sites. There is lots of information that we have to gather yet. We are going to be speaking with Canadian Mental Health Association, Children's Mental Health Ontario, Addictions and Mental Health Ontario, to understand from them what the actual statistics are to make sure that continued. Um, Supervision, uh, supervised injection sites are going to be of merit to people of Ontario. That's what we promised the people of Ontario we would do to make sure that each and every program that we provide is of benefit to the public. Supplementary. The evidence is already overwhelmingly clear. This is a full-blown public health emergency. Last year, over 300 people in Toronto from across socioeconomic classes alone died from an opioid overdose, a 121 per cent increase in just two years. But the fact is that all of these deaths are preventable, and thanks to the incredible dedication of frontline harm reduction workers, lives are being saved every day at supervised injection and overdose prevention sites in this city and across Ontario. That's the evidence. Will the Premier commit today to fully supporting overdose prevention sites and supervised injection sites, which are saving lives across Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Well, our government is committed to fighting the ongoing opioid crisis and getting people with addictions the help that they absolutely need. We are listening to the people. We are listening to the experts on the evidence available with respect to supervised injection sites. and We want to make sure that when we develop, as we are working on right now, our comprehensive mental health and addiction system, that we will get people with addictions the help that they need uh, with supervised injection sites, perhaps or with other supports that they need, but we need to listen to the experts and hear what they have to say. Stop the clock. Members will take their seat. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Don Valley East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, what does systemic racism mean to you, and do you believe it exists in Ontario? Premier. Minister of Community and Safety Services. <laughs> Minister Thank of you, Community uh, Safety Mr. and Speaker. Correctional Services. I, I want to assure the House that the anti-racism directorate is continuing to fulfill its mandate of the whole of the government approach. The approach will address systemic racism by implementing a strategic plan. This includes the implementation of an anti-racism data standards. The collection and analysis of reliable and usable data will help the government identify any systemic barriers across sectors and help make evidence-based decisions to shape policies, programs and services, ultimately improving how the people of Ontario are served. Members will take your seats. Members will please take your seats. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question uh, back to the Premier. Uh, does, will they collect the segregated race-based data in the justice system? 
Minister. As I stated, the collection of, of the data will be on the whole of government approach. So the anti-racism directorate will continue its important work and it will be on an integrated approach across government to identify initiatives that will remove systemic racism. Thank you. You can restart the clock. Next question, the member for Flamborough-Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services, and I would first like to congratulate the minister for being tasked with this very crucial responsibility. Now, with the recent indiscriminate acts of violence that have taken place on the streets of Toronto, including those that occurred most recently on the Danforth, I'm proud to see that our government, for the people, is committed to providing police with the necessary tools and resources to keep our communities safe. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, with these recent acts of gun violence, is there a message that this government would like to send to those who may feel like Ontario's streets are simply not safe? Good question. Good question. <laughs> Minister of Community Safety and Protection Services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'd like to congratulate the member from uh, flamborough granbrook on her work and uh, her achievement here. I'd like to begin by repeating that our government will not tolerate gun violence in our streets. Our government for the people will continue to ensure public safety across this province, Mr. Speaker. This government is committed. It is committed to providing our police services with the necessary tools and resources to perform their jobs safety, safely and effectively in Ontario. I'd like to add, Mr. Speaker, that last night my family and I visited the Danforth community. Based on my visit and speaking with local business owners and members of the community, as well as the police services that were present, I want to assure all Ontarians that the province's streets are safe. Here, here. My family and I enjoyed a wonderful evening on the Danforth, Mr. Speaker. I wanted to show. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. Minister, the previous Liberal government failed, failed to act to ensure that our first responders were given the necessary tools and resources to help protect Ontario communities. Our first responders are assets to our communities, and they deserve to perform those duties safely and effectively day in and day out. Mr. Speaker, our government has remained committed to ensuring public safety across this wonderful province. With those recent tragedy that occurred on the Danforth, some Ontarians are really concerned about gun violence on our streets. Mr. Speaker, will the minister please explain to the members of this legislature what he will do about those who commit gun violence in our great province? Minister. Thank you uh, once again for the question. And what I want to do is assure once again all Ontarians that our streets are safe and that this government is committing to supporting community safety throughout the province. With my recent visit to the Danforth, I was proud to walk through such an extraordinary and vibrant neighbourhood, talk with local business owners and members of the local community. Mr. Speaker, I urge all those in the Toronto area to visit the small businesses in the Danforth, as well as the upcoming Taste of the Danforth, which is scheduled to begin August 10, 2018. The Danforth is an extraordinary and vibrant community and should continue to be enjoyed by all Ontarians. Rest assured, our government is committed to supporting public safety and providing our first responders with the tools and resources they Response. require to perform their jobs safely and effectively. Once again, thank you to the men and women who provide our cities with safe streets. Thank you. Stop the clock. <clears throat> Members will take your seats. Restart the clock. Next question, member for Sudbury. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Premier. I'd like to start my question by reading an email that I received from Andrea, who's a parent from my riding of Sudbury. And I quote, I'm writing to you as a concerned parent of a transgender child. My 14-year-old child has faced harassment and bullying at school that was so extreme that he became suicidal and we had to homeschool him. The recent announcement of the Ontario government is reverting to the 20-year-old sex education curriculum is incredibly troubling to me. School was already an unsafe space for my child, and I worry it will be become even less safe for him and other LGBTQ2 plus kids if the curriculum does not reflect the realities. The old curriculum completely invalidates their experiences and even their existence. My question, Mr. Speaker, is will the Premier confirm for us here and for this family at home that the curriculum being taught this year and every year question. going forward will include LGBTQ2 plus families, gender identity, bullying, cyber safety, and consent? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. And as we have indicated all along, what we want to do is listen to parents, such as the parents that you're speaking about, to make sure we hear from everyone so that we have a proper end to end consultation that is completely inclusive, that hears from everyone. We had only a very small sample of parents that participated in the last so called consultation. We want it to be a thorough consultation that takes into account the views of everyone in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the parent Andrea wanted these words passed on to everyone here, but she actually asked, had to ask me to only use her first name for fear that using her full name would lead to further bullying for her child. This government is dragging the curriculum back to 1998 and provided no appropriate substitute. What this government fails to understand is that an inclusive education is crucial to preparing kids for their lives in and out of the classroom. It's crucial to affirming the lived experiences of all children and to set them up with the confidence and security they deserve. And so I ask, why does this government refuse to confirm their support for including these life-affirming and life-saving lessons, even in the light of demonstrated threat to students' well-being? I would say to the member through the speaker that we are committed to listening to all people in Ontario. With respect to the issue of bullying, that is not acceptable at all. We are working to fight that on all levels. That has no place in our society, either within here, within schools, or outside in society. But I'm, I'm very sad to hear that this lady was not willing to provide her last name. We want people to be able to speak up without fear. We want to hear from everyone, regardless of their experience. We want them to tell us what's happening so that we can deal with it in developing the comprehensive sex ed and health edu education curriculum that we need in Ontario. That's why we're starting this fall. We've already started our work. The Minister Order. of Education has already started work. We want to hear from everyone, all parents. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Markham Stouffville. The question is for the Minister of Economic Development, uh, Job Creation and Trade. Uh, earlier this week, uh, Minister, the OECD, uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, issued a very blunt warning uh, to Canada that it needed to. Uh, uh, address the, uh, the issues that uh, the United States have brought forward, in particular they stressed tax reform. They suggested that if Canada didn't do something about uh, addressing the American uh, changes, uh, that we risk being left behind. So I wonder, Minister, if you could uh, uh, share with the House what the government is doing to, uh, uh, to assess our tax system and to make Ontario truly open for business so that we can address these, uh, these competitive disadvantages head on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for the uh, for the question. Uh, I think the warning from the OECD uh, needs to be uh, uh, heeded by the federal government as well. Their taxes are very high, vis-à-vis uh, -vis our competitors in the United States and our competitors around the world. But Ontario, as Premier Ford uh, said during the campaign, is open for business, Mr. Speaker, and we're determined to become the economic engine of Canada once again. We're going to do that by lowering hydro rates by some 12 percent, by cutting red tape. There's some 360,000 regulations that get in the way of our job creators and creating jobs in this province. And we're not going to cut the red tape down the middle like previous governments have done. We're going to cut it right across so that we actually get rid of the stuff that's uh, getting in the way of job creation. Well, Members will please take their seats.
attacks that will kill, would have killed Spons. thousands and thousands of jobs. That tax is gone. I hope the federal government won't yeah, impose yeah, yeah, a new yeah, one on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that uh, for that answer. Uh, I know a minute hardly gives us enough time to really address what 15 years of Liberal mismanagement has done to this economy. Uh, we've seen this show again and again, Mr. Speaker, when the Ontario government, a Conservative government in Ontario, lowers taxes, its federal counterparts tend to increase taxes, thereby taking away those uh, those advantages, Mr. Speaker. So I wonder if the minister, since you're doing such a great job in such a short period of time of addressing the economic disadvantages that have been left behind by previous Liberal administrations. Is there more that we can expect over the next four years to get this economy moving so that we can really be a government for the people, Mr. Speaker, and make the changes that will bring prosperity and hope to future generations as well? Thank you. Yes. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the question. We're both off script. That's all I can tell you. I forgot it was a friendly question. <laughs> And Mr. Speaker, just to, just to continue, we, we promised during the campaign that we would lower corporate taxes by a full 1%. That hasn't been done in years in this province, from 11.5% to 10.5%. You know, one of the things we don't talk about as much, and people maybe don't understand, but by putting more money in your pocket, by lowering gasoline by, by 10 cents a litre, by getting hydro rates uh, under control, by lowering taxes for lower and middle class families, that puts money in your pocket that you can go out and buy goods and services, services and goods that are made in Ontario, and that's how we create jobs. That's how Conservatives create jobs. We don't pick winners and losers like the Liberals did and waste billions of taxpayers' dollars. We get it right. We level the playing field so that all of our businesses can be competitive and that we create the economic client for those men and women that put their money forward. Restart the clock. Member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The City of St. Catharines is facing an urgent crisis in affordable housing. Yes. Shelters are bursting at the seams, and people are being forced out on the streets because of skyrocketing rents, ridiculous wait lists, and low vacancies. The average wait time for a one-bedroom for a single person between the age of 16 and 54 in St. Catharines is an astonishing 13 years. Oh my goodness. My speak Mr. Speaker, this is unacceptable. A safe, affordable home is a human's right. Will this government commit to fund the affordable housing units that St. Catharines desperately needs? Minister of Finance. Thank you very much Minister for the Finance. question. Uh, as you've heard our Premier Ford throughout the election, this campaign was for the people. You are going to see genuine relief for families. You're going to see prosperity return to the province of Ontario. You're going to see a province that, as the minister said earlier, is open for business. So we are going to scrap the cap and trade and put $260 back in the pockets of every family. We are going to lower gasoline by 10 cents a litre. Speaker, the 20 per cent tax cut for middle families is, is underway. We've got hydro rates that are being reduced 12 per cent. Speaker, we've got a great plan that's for the people that'll bring real relief and put true relief uh, for families in Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government campaigned on a promise to develop affordable housing in the GTA. Let me be clear. The affordable housing crisis is not limited to one Toronto and surrounding areas. People across this great, abundant province are living in fear, not knowing where they're going to sleep tonight or tomorrow night. I will repeat myself. This is unacceptable. 
When will the people of Ontario across the GTA and beyond see action from this government on building affordable housing? Thank you very much. Well, as I said uh, earlier, uh, Speaker, this plan uh, from Premier Ford and from our party is a plan that's for the people. We will bring genuine relief for the people of Ontario. We have uh, support for municipalities that is underway. We're scrapping the, crap, the, sca the, the uh, cap and trade tax. That is probably the most single most important issue that's facing the, the uh, pocketbooks of people today. Not only will it put $260 back in the pockets of families, but, Speaker, it's going to create jobs and give people an opportunity to find true employment in the province of Ontario that many of them had lost out on because of the uh, cap-and-trade program that was put in place. So when you see that, uh, in addition to lower gas ta uh, lower price at the pumps, Speaker, along with uh, smaller tax rates, a reduction of the middle-class tax, uh, taxes, you are going to see absolute true relief. For the first time in 15 years, families will feel it in their pocketbooks. They'll have real, genuine relief. Next question. The member for Etobicoke Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Each September, the world comes to Toronto for a celebration of the best in Canadian and international cinema. They come to the Toronto International Film Festival, also known as TIFF. TIFF. As you know, the lineup of films and programming was released by the festival yesterday. This was something that I was personally very excited about when I worked for the City of Toronto. As you know, TIFF is one of the most important events that takes place each year here in the City of Toronto, both economically and culturally. Can the minister provide us with any information on the government's commitment to TIFF and their plans for the 2018 festival? Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke Centre. I know that uh, you understand the value of it because, frankly, Etobicoke is a bit of a hub for our film industry here in Ontario. TIFF is one of the most prestigious and respected film festivals in the world. Since 1976, TIFF has featured the best in international and Canadian films, many that are being screened for the first time. This year's lineup includes 21 world premieres, seven international premieres, eight North American premieres, and 11 Canadian premieres. Our government is proud to support TIFF and other film festivals across the province. This festival has been an important venue for Canadian filmmakers and an important driver for tourism in Ontario and Toronto. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. I am glad to hear that this government is taking the necessary steps to ensure we are bringing good jobs and more investment, both foreign and domestic, for the people of this province. A strong film industry is not just good for business and the people it employs, it is good for communities across Ontario. I agree that the Toronto International Film Festival contributes to building that strong industry. Can the minister outline how TIFF continues to be a major tourism driver for the City of Toronto and the province of Ontario? Minister. Thank you for the question. Absolutely a tourism driver, also an economic driver. Ontario is one of the largest film and television production centres in North America. TIFF highlights Toronto's reputation as a vital international creative centre. Last year, TIFF had over 3,000 volunteers donate almost 100,000 hours to TIFF, earning it the nickname of the Friendly Festival. Last year, film and tele television production, supported by our province and government, contributed $1.6 billion to the provincial economy, the seventh year in a row over the $1 billion mark. TIFF is another example to show that Ontario excels at hosting internationally renowned events, attracts tourism across our province, and shows the global film industry that Ontario is open for business. Thank you. Next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, this government claims to be for the people. Well, a major issue in a major issue in Scarborough Southwest is the lack of long-term care beds and the quality of care available to the people in Scarborough Southwest. One constituent's mother fell four weeks ago. 
She has dementia and has been in the hospital and then moved to a day uh, program ever since. She needs long-term care. She now has to leave the temporary uh, day program without hope of a long-term bed. Long-term care is at a crisis point, and now it's this government's crisis. So, Mr. Speaker, would this Premier promise that there would be thousands of long-term beds while not increasing spending and without cutting a single frontline job? So, can he tell us yes. when Question. can this family in Scarborough Southwest expect relief and how? Minister Health, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you very much for the question. We are certainly aware that there is a crisis in long-term care across this province, in your riding, and many others across the province, due to 15 years of inaction by the previous government. That's why one of our central campaign promises was to build 15,000 more beds in five years, 30,000 more beds in five years. That is one of our important commitments to the people of Ontario and one that we plan to commit. Uh, to continue with and make sure that we do it. We did it in the previous Promise government. Made. We'll do it again this time. Promise made. Promise made. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the minister for her response. But the problem persists. This government seems to continue campaigning while we need real action. New Democrats have been calling for a public inquiry into the tragic long-term care debt in the Wetlawfer uh, case that's to be extended uh, to lo look into all the systemic issues with long-term care in the province. And as MPP, I see these issues all the time. Another constituent's mother is currently in a nursing home in Scarborough. They describe a home full of vulnerable people, without relief from the heat as there is no air conditioning. The home is privately run by a U.S. giant private health provider called Extendicare. Yep. Mr. Speaker, is this the model that the Premier is proposing for long-term care in this province, more of the same? And would the Premier tell the people of Scarborough and of this province when these 15,000 care beds will be provided? Thank you. Uh, we are working on the plan for capacity as we speak. I have been speaking with the members of the Ministry of Health about this issue. We are working on it now because we realize to provide 15,000 beds in five years is a big commitment and one that has to be undertaken immediately. So we are certainly doing that. With respect to your question about the inquiry that's going on, it is proceeding, as you know. Uh, and we look forward to hearing the results of that and making whatever changes need to be made as a result. We can't comment any further on it because it is not appropriate in this location, but we are following it and we will make changes if they're necessary based on the recommendations that are com coming forward. So we take this issue very seriously and we'll take action when we need to. Thank you. Next question. Member for Brampton South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the government health leader and minister of government and consumer services. Speaker, our government brought the house back just 12 days after swearing in of cabinet because there were areas of public interest that required urgent action. The people sent us here to get down to work and we've done just that. Can the minister give the House an update on the progress we've made on our urgent priorities? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member for Brampton South. And can I say that the people of Brampton South made the right decision when they sent that member to the legislature? Take the seats. Mr. Speaker, our government was clear the people of Ontario couldn't afford to wait, and that's why our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, acted immediately to get down to business and brought in our Urgent Priorities Act. We have hit the ground running, Mr. Speaker. The people of Ontario spoke. They wanted us to clean up the hydro mess. That's what we're doing on this side of the House. We needed to get the kids back in class at York University. That's what we're going to do. The Liberal energy policy has been a mess. In just a few minutes, we'll be able to vote against that and vote for this bill, Mr. Speaker. I encourage the next to do that. Take your seats. Restart the clock. Supplementary. 
Uh, back to the minister. I thank the minister for the update. The problem is still I would stop the clock. Yeah. House will come to order. We're on a supplementary question. Yeah, yeah. House will come to order. House will come to order. The House will come to order. House will come to order. We're on a supplementary question. Back to the minister. I thank the minister for the update. During debate, we've seen members of the opposition defend the policies of the previous Liberal government on hydro. And that's after spending 28 days telling Ontarians how awful they are. Speaker, can the minister update, on, update the House on why Bill 2 is so necessary? Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thanks again to the member from Brampton South for a great question. You know, it's shameful that the opposition would defend the mess that the previous Liberal government made of hydro. People of Ontario deserve better. And that's what this government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, is going to do. That's why we recalled the House early, so we could get down to business and tackle some of these issues, including putting nine white elephants on the south shore of Prince Edward County. That's exactly what the WPD project would be, and that's exactly what the members of the official opposition used to rail about in this House day after day. They're going to have the opportunity to do something about it in just a couple of minutes' time. They can vote. To support the, right the Urgent Priorities Act in this do legislature. The right I encourage them to do that. Look after the Liberal Hydro mess, get the kids back in class, and get Ontario back. Members will take their seats. Order. Order. Can we restart the clock? Member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The NDP had been calling on the previous government for years to commit to a firm timeline for the expansion of GO Train service to Niagara. Niagara was finally promised year round service by 2021. But during the campaign, the Premier put the entire expansion into question, saying that he would have to review it. That would be taking transit in Niagara from bad to worse. So I ask, will this government commit here and now to the 2021 timeline for GO Train expansion into Niagara? Premier. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank the member from Niagara for the question. The Premier has made it clear we're going to expand GO Rail throughout this province, including all-day two-way service to Bowmanville, Kitchener and Niagara. It's clear, and we've made it clear, that Premier Ford will be known as the Transit Premier. We recognize the challenge of moving people in this province is one that hamstrings our economy. So we're going to make sure that we move people more efficiently and we move goods more efficiently. One of the keys to an expanding and a growing and a flourishing economy is our ability to move people along on their daily commute. So, to the member, you can relax. We are committed to expanding the goal to Niagara. You can count on it. Supplementary. 
Speaker, expanding GO Train service would have a positive impact on the Niagara economy. The expansion will inject $195 million into the Niagara region. And the minister didn't answer the question. We asked when. The expansion will create 2,400 new permanent full-time jobs, as well as another 1,200 full-time jobs during construction. It will connect all the people of Niagara with employment opportunities around the GTA, and it will connect the residents of the GTA to the region's wineries, gaming and horse racing facilities, and of course, our iconic Niagara Falls. So I ask again, will this government commit today to the 2021 timeline for expanding GO Train service to Niagara. Thank you, Minister. Well, Speaker, I, and I appreciate the uh, the member's uh, commitment to this project, but it is no greater than our commitment here in the PC government under Premier Ford. We were elected on a plan to change what was going wrong in Ontario. Some of our first acts to get rid of the carbon tax, to get rid of cap and trade to fix the mess at Hydro, to get the children and the students back to school at New York University. So one of the things we're doing right with our first bill here, Bill 2, is to get that done. But our commitment to expanding transit is, as I said yesterday, as ironclad as the rails that grow will run on. We, will absolute, we have absolutely made that clear. So we're working with our partners at GO and Metrolinx and reviewing all of the plans and all of the schedules so we have a comprehensive Once. and a wholesome approach to developing transit here in the GTA and beyond, including tonight. Member for King Vaughan. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of this Premier, we are undertaking on a bold plan to grow our economy, to create good paying jobs. And Mr. Speaker. Member, who's the question referred to? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, under the leadership of this Premier, if I may begin again, undertake a bold plan to grow our economy, create good paying jobs. And Mr. Speaker, this is a plan to create hope, opportunity, and prosperity for every single Ontarian in every single region of this province. Mr. Speaker, this plan, our plan, will grow our economy and put our province back on track. And this is in sharp contrast to a record under the former New Democratic government under Bob Ray. And yes, Mr. Speaker, they can relish in the record of one. 125,000 people out of work. Mr. Speaker, a 20, a 28 percent unemployment rate. Mr. Question. Speaker, the highest marginal personal tax rate in this continent. I remember. Thank you, Minister of Finance. Well, thank you very much for the uh, question, Speaker. Uh, this government was elected for the people, and we will restore trust in the people of Ontario. <laughs> Under the, previous, under the previous Liberal administration, businesses had left the province of Ontario. Two years ago, there were 2,700 businesses that left. They were struggling, and, and many more were seriously thinking about closing or relocating. A Doug Ford government is committed to making our business taxes competitive and reducing uh, overall costs for our innovators here in Ontario. Our plan includes reducing business taxes from 11.5 to 10.5%, lowering manufacturing and processing rates by the same amount, cutting the small business tax rate by 8.75%, lowering hydro rates by 12 per cent. Speaker, we are going to be open for business. Promises made, promises kept. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Finance. I want to thank him for his leadership and for his commitment to restoring the spirit of entrepreneurship in this province. Mr. Speaker, we know that our plan will foster growth. It will improve our competitiveness. It will create value-added jobs for our young people. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance outline why this government can never go back and why we must move this province forward? Here, here, Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker. 
it, again, it's all about restoring trust. So the fact that this, uh, we have a bonus round question here, I do want to talk about Northern Ontario and the employment performance. Speaker, we know that for 15 years, my beloved Northern Ontario has been ignored by the previous Liberal government. Since June of 2009, Northern Ontario has experienced a net loss of 2,000 jobs. This government respects the North and will do everything necessary to make life affordable and create good jobs in the north and across Ontario. And that means reducing taxes, reducing hydro rates and reducing red tape that is stifling uh, uh, job creation. We've made very firm commitments in the north, Speaker, including sharing resource development that help northern and indigenous communities. Response. Uh, speaker, we're going to cut aviation fuel tax, bring back the passenger rail service in the north. and. Thank you. Members of the police We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 2, an act respecting Hydro One Limited, the termination of the White Pines Wind Project, and the labour disputes between York University and Canadian Union of Public Employees, Local 3903. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
I ask the members to take their seats. I hate to interrupt, but we're in a vote. I would ask the members to please take their seats. On July the 19th, Mr. Rickford moved second reading of Bill 2. All those in favour will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Mr. Smith Bay Quinty. Mr. Smith Bay Quinty. Mr. Bethlehem Favre. Mr. Bethlehem Favre. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Mr. Elliott. Mr. Elliott. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Yakabuski. Yakabuski. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Miller. Perry Salmascoca. Miller Perry Salmascoca. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Mr. Key. Mr. Key. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Kalan. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Triantafilopoulos. Mrs. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Samar. Mrs. Samar. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Smith. Peterborough Kawartha. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Babikian. Mrs. Babikian. Mr. Boma. Mr. Boma. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tanigas. Mr. Tanigas. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Cusetto. Mr. Baber. Mr. Baber. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bogwan. Mr. Bogwan. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. The ayes are 69, the nays are 44. The ayes being 69, the nays being 44, I declare the motion carried. <laughs> Pursuant to the order of the House, dated July 24, 2018, the bill is now ordered for a third reading. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.